Good morning. Nine o'clock, time to begin our study of the book of Revelation, and we're in lesson 14. And we're in chapter 4. We'll be picking up in just a moment in verse 9 of chapter 4, where we left off last week. Last week we saw that in chapter 4, God draws aside the curtain of heaven to give John a vision of the majestic throne of God. And then uh, next in chapter 5, which we'll get to today, we will see uh, the focus not on God the Father, but on God the Son. And together, chapters 4 and 5 will provide the basis for everything that's going to follow in this book. This wonderful vision of God the Father here in chapter 4, and then we'll see God the Son in chapter 5. Beautiful, beautiful chapters. All the judgments that we're about to see in this book are coming from the throne of God, and that's the message here in chapters 4 and 5. Let's begin our class with a prayer. Our dear Father in heaven, we're thankful for this wonderful opportunity we have, Father, an opportunity each week to gather together and to study your word, Father, and to learn more about you. We're thankful for this, this day you've set aside, Father, for us to come together and assemble and worship you, Father, and we're thankful for that. And we're thankful that we can freely do these things in this country. We know there are many places in the world where that is not true. And Father, we're thankful for this wonderful vision of, of heaven that we see here in this chapter and in this book, Father. And we're thankful that we have a home prepared there with you and our prayers that we will always endeavor to remain faithful unto death so that we can join you eternally in that wonderful home, Father. And most of all, we're thankful for Jesus, our Lord, our Savior, our King, and we pray these things in his name. Amen. Chapter 4, verse 9. And when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne, who liveth forever and ever, the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever, and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. When the four living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to God, the 24 elders here fall down before God and worship Him, and they cast their crowns before the throne. This act of casting their crowns before the throne shows that, that they understand that, that whatever authority they have is a delegated authority. It comes from God. They owe their existence, they owe their present status completely to God's power and to God's will. Yes, they reign. They have crowns. But unlike the Roman emperors, these 24 elders do not claim to reign apart from God. They understand that their reign comes from God, who is the true king over all. Now, we know that Christians, we in the church, have a special delegated reign from Christ. We've read about that in Romans 5, 17. We see that in 1 Peter 2, verse 9. But is there some sense in which all men, Christian and non-Christian, have a, a delegated reign from God? And the answer is yes. We see that all the way back in the garden. We see that in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion. Literally, let them rule. Let them rule over the fish of the sea, the fowl of the air, the cattle, earth, everything that creepeth. In fact, the context there in Genesis 1 suggests that man's ability to rule, his ability to reign, is one way in which he shares in the image of God. That's the context there in Genesis 1.26. All men have a responsibility to rule according to the will of God. Why? Because their ruling and it is coming from God, is delegated from God. God is giving them that ability, he's giving them that rule. The Roman emperors did not believe that. They did not understand that. But they're very soon going to learn otherwise. And this, when, when we see these 24 elders casting their crowns before the throne, that's a sharp contrast to the Roman emperors. Twice here we see the phrase, who liveth forever and ever. We see that twice here. Of course, that's emphasizing God's eternal nature. Again, stark contrast to the supposed Roman deities the Roman emperors who had been created and who had an appointment with death. Uh, many of them had already met that appointment. Nero, for example. Um, and in fact, it reminds me of Psalm 22, 29, verse 29. 
All they that go down to the dust shall bow before him, and none can keep alive his own soul, the psalmist reminds us. The Roman emperors believed they were all powerful, but they could not keep themselves from dying. They could not keep alive their own soul. The Greek word translated worship in verse 10, it means to prostrate, prostrate oneself before deity, to kiss the feet or the hem of the garment. Uh, in fact, verse 10 tells us explicitly that these 24 elders fell down. They fell down before God and worshipped Him. And that's what the word worship here means in verse 10. To, to a first century reader, verse 11 brings the, what I think is the central theme of this book, front and center. Caesar or Christ? Caesar or Christ? The throne of Caesar or the throne of God? Throne of Caesar or the throne of God? Well, why does verse 11 bring that to the forefront? Because a Roman emperor believed that he was Lord, that he was worthy of glory and honor and praise. And in fact, the phrase is, worthy art thou and our Lord and God, those two phrases were used in the worship of the Roman emperor and applied to the Roman emperor. In fact, the emperor Domitian took Lord and God as his official title, and he required all announcements and proclamations in Rome to begin with the phrase, our Lord and God Domitian commands. So when we see this language here in verse 11 applied to God, that's to the first century mind, that's the stark contrast between the throne of God and the throne of Caesar, and the worship of God and the worship of Caesar. Verse 11 leaves no doubt at all as to who alone is worthy of worship. And it's not Caesar. It's not Caesar. In fact, verse 11 explains why that is true. Why? Because God is the creator of all things. That's why he alone is worthy of our worship. No Roman emperor could ever make that claim. The Roman emperors were creatures. They weren't creators. The beautiful scene in this chapter is one of unending worship of God by the cherubim and by the church. And in fact, chapter 4 shows all creation worshiping the Creator. This point is made so frequently in this book of Revelation. We're going to see it again and again. I think it should probably be added to our list of themes, which is becoming kind of lengthy here, but we've got a lot going on in this book. And one of our, our other themes, I think, is that nothing created is worthy of worship. Nothing that has been created by God is worthy of worship. Only the Creator is worthy of worship. Uh, later, John will be told, uh, John will fall down at the feet of someone, and John will be told, no, Revelation 22, verse 9, worship God, John will be told. That's a theme in this book. Don't worship Caesar, worship God. Why? Because God is the Creator. Caesar is just a creature, and a disobedient creature at that. You know, Romans 1.25 depicts sinful man worshiping and serving the creature rather than the creator. That's Romans 1.25. And I don't think it should be surprising to us that that verse from Romans perfectly describes the Romans, <laughs> the Romans who were worshiping the Roman emperor. They were worshiping and serving the creature rather than the creator. Finally, as we come to the end of chapter 4, let's pause to think about the first century church, the persecuted first century Christians who were initially reading these verses, who were the first to read these verses. These verses are here to provide them comfort. In fact, this book is here to provide them comfort, but particularly these verses are here to provide that persecuted first century church comfort. They needed to know that despite how things may have seemed when viewed from an earthly perspective, God was in charge. God was ruling the universe from his throne in heaven. Rome was not in charge. The first century church had not been forgotten. Rome was not going to win. These are all messages of chapter 4, as heaven is opened and they see the throne of God. And no matter what happens in this life, the church must continually and, and unendingly worship and serve God. 
The church in these verses is represented by the 24 elders, and they offer unending praise to God. Do you mean we're supposed to praise God even during persecution? Yes, in fact, I would say especially during persecution. Especially during persecution. We must continue to offer unending praise to God. In fact, I think it's praise that puts persecution into perspective. Then that's, that's what lets us know why we're enduring this persecution and what's at the other end of it and what, we'll, what, we'll, what we will have when we come through that persecution faithful to God. Our praise puts that all into perspective. That's why chapter 4 is here. Questions about chapter 4? Chapter 5, verse 1. And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside, sealed with seven seals. Wow, the seven seals. That's one of the, uh, the most well-known symbols from the book of Revelation. And we're, we're about to start taking these seals off here uh, pretty soon, uh, but not yet. Uh, verse 1, uh, the contents of this scroll that we see in verse 1, uh, it says, uh, the, the King James says book, it's really a scroll. Uh, they're going to be revealed in the chapters that follow, the contents of this scroll. But here we get a description of the scroll, what it looked like. And it was written within and on the back. And it, as we see, it was sealed with seven seals. Now, you know, what we sometimes call a book, as I say, was really a scroll. That's what, we, what, uh, what was being held here. Uh, scrolls were typically made of, a, of single papyrus sheets. Um, about 10 by 8 inches is about a sheet of papyrus, and they'd piece them together. Uh, they were joined together horizontally when a longer scroll was needed, which was usually the case, particularly in a book like this. Um, and then the writing was done in narrow columns, about three inches long in, in columns as the scroll was unwound. Um, there would be a, a wooden roller at each end of the scroll, so you could roll it this way or you could roll it that way. Uh, and it was held in the left hand and unrolled with the right uh, and as the reading went on, the part in the left hand was rolled up again. So it just kind of, you sat here like this, rolling both sides as the, as the text moved past you and you would read it. Um, the book of Revelation would have required a scroll about 15 feet long in that scroll to contain the entire book of Revelation. Now this scroll was written on the front and on the back, which is an interesting addition to tell us here. Uh, in making papyrus paper, uh, the rows of papyrus were laid down uh, vertically with another strip laid down horizontally. So on one side they'd be horizontal, on the other side vertical. Um, and then the whole thing was moistened with water and kind of glued together and then you'd have your, 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 your paper that you would write on. But one side was running horizontally and the other side the, 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 the texture was running vertically. So normally you'd write on the horizontal side because that, that kept your pen going in the right direction and all the, most of the strokes went in that direction. Uh, that's, that was called the recto uh, side of the, of the papyrus, and that was the side you naturally would write on. Um, the other side was called the verso, and you would typically not write on the verso because it ran the wrong way. It was harder to write on. Uh, but papyrus was expensive. So a lot of times you would write on both sides. Um, and if you did that, you had what is called an opistograph. Uh, that's a piece of papyrus or a scroll that's written on both sides, uh, uh, the horizontal side and the vertical side. The scroll in God's hand here is an opistograph. It's written both within and on the back. You can see the writings on both sides, or John can see the writings on both sides. And that tells us something. It contains the full will of God, that, that God didn't want to waste any space. He had a lot of important things to say, and he wrote on the front, and he wrote on the back. He had a lot of things to say here. And I think that's an important message also for them. They hadn't been forgotten. God had a lot of things to say to them and about them and about Rome. Um, the fact that it was written, the fact that it was written, that tells us that, that, that this is something that's going to happen. It's been determined. It's not going it, to, there's no turning back. There, there's no delay. That it's written, it's in God's hand, it's ready to go. And in fact, the seals are about to start coming off of this thing, and then it's going to start. Uh, we see something similar in, in Ezekiel. Ezekiel also had a book in Ezekiel 2, verse 10. It had writing on the front and on the back. And there was written on it words of lamentation and mourning and woe, we read in Ezekiel, 1, 20, in Ezekiel 2, verse 10. Um, 
Well, Rome's very soon going to find out that that comparison with Ezekiel's book goes beyond how it was written. Yeah, they're both written on the front and the back. But Rome's about to find out that, that, that this scroll also contains lamentation and mourning and woe for them, for Rome. So they're about to start seeing what's in this scroll. The seven seals on the scroll. Well, we've seen the number seven. We know what, what that means. Here it means this scroll was perfectly and completely sealed. That, that it's going to take someone awfully special to get these seals off of this scroll. In fact, soon we're going to see there's a search to see who can take the seals off of this scroll. Um, Roman law required last wills and testaments to be sealed with the seals of seven witnesses. Uh, similar to wills today, they had to be witnessed. In Rome it was seven, seven people then sealed with seven, uh, seven seals. Um, so that, that image also had a particular meaning to the Roman mind. It meant something complete, something final, something that ready to be revealed at the proper time. No one had tampered with it. It had come straight from the source. As of verse 1 here in chapter 5, God's plan has not yet been put into effect. Uh, in fact, it has not yet been revealed yet in chapter, chapter 5. The judgments within the scroll have not been executed. The scroll has not yet been opened in the first verse of chapter 5. But that's all about to change. We're going to see these seals removed one by one by one by one until all seven are off of that scroll. This use of seals reminds us of Daniel 8.26 we looked at earlier. There Daniel was told to seal up the vision that he saw. Why? Dan why? Because it pertains to many days hence. Daniel was told in Daniel 8.26. The period many days hence in Daniel 8.26, well, we studied all about that, and we saw it was about 400 years, about 400 years. And Daniel was told, you seal that up, Daniel, because that's a long way off. That's 400 years from now. These seals are coming off of this scroll. And in fact, in chapter 22, verse 10, John will be told to not seal up the vision that he's about to see. Why? Because the time is here. The time is now. It's about to happen soon. We have to ask people who look at this book and say that nothing in it has happened yet. <laughs> what? How do they explain these seals? How do they explain the fact these seals have come off? How do they explain the difference between what Daniel was told and what John is told? This book has a time frame. Everything in this book is pointing to that time frame. These seals came off in the first century. Verse 2, and I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much, because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders saith unto me, weep not, Behold, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. Wow, that's beautiful. The question here is not who is able to open the seals. The question is who is worthy to open the seals. Because if they're worthy, then they'll be able to do that. Whoever opens the scrolls, is the seals, and opens that scroll is going to be responsible for what follows. The word worthy here literally means of sufficient weight. Who is weighty enough to open these seals? That word, by the way, is one of those words that occurs exactly seven times in this book, and there's quite a few of them. Interesting uh, structure underneath in this beautiful book. We're going to see this strong angel, perhaps another strong angel, again in chapter 10 and again in chapter 18. In chapter 10, the strong angel is going to lift his right hand to heaven and swear that there will be no more delay. So whenever we see this strong angel, we need to remember the time frame of this book. Even this strong angel, though, is not worthy to open this scroll. In fact, no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth is worthy to do that. The phrase under the earth likely denotes the grave or the place of the dead. We see that in Ephesians 4, 9, and 10. We see that in Romans 10, verse 7. So taken together, this phrase, in heaven, on earth, under the earth, it denotes the entire universe of created beings, both alive and dead. No one is worthy to open this scroll. None of the creation is. 
It reminds us of Philippians 2 verse 10, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, all creation. No one in all of creation was worthy to open the scroll and to loosen the seals. And John wept. He wept much, we are told. Why? Why did John weep? If the scrolls were not opened, there would be no protection for God's people. There would be no judgments against the enemies of God. There would be no ultimate triumph for believers. There would be no new heaven and no new earth. Why did John weep? John wept at the delay that would occur if this scroll were not opened. None of these wonderful things would happen if that scroll remained shut and sealed. John was weeping at the delay. And how would John have reacted had he picked up a modern commentary that says 2,000 years and counting that none of it has yet happened? I think John would be weeping at that right along with the rest of us. What was John told to do here? John was told to quit crying and look at Jesus. Now that's good advice under any circumstance, isn't it? Weep not, behold the lion of the tribe of Judah. No one in God's creation was worthy to open those seals, so John was told to look instead to Jesus, the eternal source of all creation, outside the created order. Look to Jesus. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah. It reminds me of Hebrews 12, verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. What does it mean to look unto Jesus? Well, after we're added to the eternal kingdom of God by our obedience to the gospel of Christ, Jesus changes how we see everything. Suddenly, we're seeing everything differently. We don't see ourselves the same. We don't see other people the same way. We don't see the earth the same way. We don't see our material possessions the same way. Everything changes how we see things. It all changes when we become a child of God. And if we want to see things as God sees them, we have to look at them in the light of Christ. We need to look unto Jesus. I loved how C.S. Lewis explained this. If you've, you've been in my classes, you know C.S. Lewis is one of my very favorite authors. And he has a way of just going right to the point. And here's what he said about this. He says, we believe that the sun is in the sky at midday not because we can clearly see the sun. In fact, we cannot clearly see the sun. We believe it because we can see everything else. Jesus is like the sun. It is only by the light of Jesus that we see things as they really are. Absent that light, we're living in darkness. And we're not seeing things as they really are. Everything about us, everything about us is determined by how we see Jesus. John 8, verse 12, Jesus spake unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. John 12, 35 and 36, Jesus said unto them, Yet a little while is the light with you. Walk while ye have the light, lest darkness come upon you. In John 12, 46, I am come a light into the world. Note where each of those verses came from. They came from the book of John, the gospel of John. The theme of seeing things as God sees them is not confined to this book of Revelation. It's also a central theme in the book of John, the other book that, one of the other books that John wrote. John's eyes had been opened, and John wanted everyone else's eyes to be opened as well. We see here in verse 5 three descriptions of Jesus. The lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, and the one who hath, past tense, prevailed. Let's look at each of those. The lion, it's the most often named animal in the Bible. And yet I believe it's only here that it has an unmistakable messianic meaning. 
The Lion of the tribe of Judah is used here as a messianic title. We know that Jesus was from the tribe of Judah, Hebrews 7, 14. And we can recall the description of Judah that we find in Genesis 49, 9, and 10. Judah is a lion's whelp, and later the scepter shall not depart from Judah. So I think that's what this title is pointing back to, that Christ was from the tribe of Judah. That was the ruling tribe. Christ was the lion, the tribe of Judah. The Root of David, also a messianic title. We know that Jesus descended from David according to the flesh, Romans 1, verse 3. And we recall Isaiah 11, verse 1 and 11, verse 10, speaking of David's father, Jesse. There shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse which shall stand for an ensign of the people. That's speaking of Christ. It's a messianic title, the root of Jesse, the root of David, rather. Finally, Jesus is described in verse 5 as the one who hath, past tense, prevailed or conquered. It's probably a better uh, translation than prevailed there. Conquered to open the book. Not that he's about to conquer, but he has already conquered. Jesus is not opening the scroll so that he can prevail. Jesus is opening the scroll because he has already prevailed. And again, we can turn back to the Gospel of John to see this. John 16, 33, I have overcome the world, past tense. Yes, that was spoken prior to the cross, but it was spoken just prior to the cross, an anticipation of what Jesus was about to endure there in laying down his life for his sheep. Here's the key point. Jesus overcame the world long before the events we're reading about here in Revelation chapter 5 and in the book of Revelation. There's no great battle between good and evil in the book of Revelation with an uncertain outcome. The outcome is never in doubt because the outcome has already occurred. Later in Revelation 12 verse 8, we're going to be told that, that, that the great dragon, Satan, prevailed not, conquered not. Satan was defeated, in fact, at the cross. Satan never stands a chance in this book. He probably thought he did, but he never did. In fact, Jesus conquered Rome at the cross. Stop and think about that for a minute. Jesus conquered Rome at the cross. In fact, Jesus was conquering Rome at the very point that Rome thought it was conquering Jesus. Things are not what they seem. And if we follow the example of Christ, then the world may see our great victory as a great defeat. But what determines whether it's a great victory or a great defeat? It's not how the world looks at it. How God sees it. And if God sees it as a great victory, then it is a great victory. What spiritual eyes see as a great victory is often seen by physical eyes as a great defeat. The cross being the best example of that. But once again, things are not always what they seem. What is the purpose of the beautiful picture of Christ that we find in these verses? This picture emphasizes how great a thing it is to which Christ is here called. Christ will protect his kingdom. He will sustain his kingdom. This kingdom that he died to, to create, he will protect and sustain it as he does today. Jesus loves his church. Jesus loves the church. What a wonderful message at any time. For the church to hear. Of course, I think it's self-evident that God did not need to search for someone to open the scroll. God did not need to search for Christ. This searching, this waiting, it's, it's there for dramatic effect. The angel in verse 2, I think he knows the answer to that question before he asks it. The book of Revelation is written to have an emotional impact on the reader, and perhaps that's no more clear than right here in chapter 5. That's why we see these dramatic images, and that's why we see these vivid symbols. That's why we have this dramatic tension in these verses. 
Well, did it have an emotional impact on its initial readers? Look at verse 4. I wept much, John says. Yes, it had an emotional impact. That's what it was intended to have on them. Comfort them and encourage them. Verse 6. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of saints." John looks over, expecting to see the great heroic lion that will unloose the seals and save the day. And what does John see? Not a lion, but a lamb. He sees a lamb. In fact, John sees a little lamb standing as it had been slain. Where's the power in that? Things are not always as they seem, are they? Three words in the New Testament are translated lamb, Aaron, Amnos, and Arneon. The first word occurs only in Luke 10, verse 3. The second occurs four times, John, Acts, and 1 Peter. The third word for lamb in the New Testament occurs 29 times in the book of Revelation, 28 of which are in reference to Jesus, the other being in chapter 13, verse 11. In fact, the only other place where that particular word for lamb appears in the New Testament is, guess where? Book of John, 21, verse 15, where Jesus asked Peter to feed my lambs. It's the same word for lamb that we find applied here to Christ 28 times. That Greek word for lamb that's used 28 times in this book in reference to Christ really means little lamb, little lamb. In fact, a better English translation might be lambkin, small baby lamb. To the world, to the world it would be hard to imagine something more vulnerable, more defenseless than a baby lamb. Things are not always as they seem, though, are they? Yes, the church will be victorious. But as with the Lamb of God, that victory will come through sacrifice. Matthew 16, 24, Whosoever will save his life shall lose it. Whoever shall lose his life for my sake shall find it. 1 John 5, verse 4, This is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. The victory of the church did not then and does not today come through physical force or, or through great demonstrations of earthly power. Our victory comes through faith. Our victory comes through sacrifice. Our victory comes, up, comes through giving up our life for Christ. Faith is the victory. And the path to victory is faithfulness unto death. What is meant by the phrase, as it had been slain? Well, it means that the lamb had the marks of slaughter upon it. It does not mean that the lamb merely looked like it had been slain. It means the lamb had been slain. And the marks of that event were still evident upon it. But this lamb is standing, isn't it? Standing. That's a vision of victory through sacrifice, a vision of victory through suffering. This lamb, of course, we know who this lamb is. This lamb is, is Jesus, who overcame the world through his perfect sacrifice. John 1, 29, behold the lamb of God. 1 Corinthians 5, verse 7, Christ is our Passover lamb. 1 Peter 1, 18 through 19, Christ as of a lamb without blemish, without spot. Isaiah 53, verse 7, he is brought as a lamb to the slaughter. Jesus, the Lamb of God. He conquered not by force, 
but by death, his own death on the cross. Jesus conquered not by taking the lives of others, but by laying down his own life for the sheep. John 10, 14 and 15. Jesus conquered not as a lion, but as a lamb. And by that example, his disciples must follow. That's how we conquer. You know, we tend to see a lamb as a docile and helpless creature. But we're going to find pretty soon this lamb is very different from that. We need to remember something about this lamb. This lamb is also a lion. And in fact, when we get to Revelation 6, verse 16, we're going to read about the wrath of the Lamb. Think about that phrase for a moment. Literally, it's the wrath of the Lambkin. If there's a more remarkable or terrifying phrase in the Bible, I'm not sure what it is. That is a remarkable image, and it should have been extremely terrifying to those who are be receiving that wrath, the Romans. Why does this lamb have seven horns? Well, we saw that symbol before. We saw it in our study of Daniel. We saw it in our study of Zechariah. A horn denotes power, often used to denote a king. In fact, these seven horns here, I think, depict Jesus' complete and perfect power. Later in Revelation, as it was in Daniel, we are going to see the horns denoting kings. So these seven horns, I think, also depict Christ's perfect royalty. He is the perfect king. He has complete sovereignty. King of kings and Lord of lords. This lamb also has seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God. We've also looked at that symbol before. We saw earlier where we, we said it denotes the Holy Spirit. Seven denoting the perfection, knowledge, of wisdom of the Holy Spirit. That's also true here, but I think it's also talking about Jesus' perfect knowledge about all things. Jesus knows what is happening to his people. How did he start off each of the letters to the seven churches? I know. I know what's going on. That's Jesus' message here. The church thought it had been forgotten. Jesus said, no, nope, you haven't been forgotten. I know everything that's happening. And we see that over and over in this book. The golden vials full of odors, they're the prayers of the saints. We're going to see later in this book that everything that's happening here is coming as a result of the prayers of the saints. That's what started all of this off. We're going to see that later in this book. And we should notice something wonderful about these prayers here, something truly wonderful about them. Yes, they were despised on earth, but in heaven they are brought to God in golden bowls. It reminds us of Psalm 141, verse 2. Let my prayers be set forth before thee as incense, and the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. A central lesson in this book for us today is the power of prayer. The power of prayer. We're soon going to see that this judgment against Rome is happening because of the prayers of the saints. Yes, we are to love our enemies. Yes, we are to pray for our enemies. But sometimes we can pray that God will judge them because perhaps in that judgment they will finally see the error of their ways. And that's exactly the kind of prayers that started off this book and what's happening in this book. Notice that each of the elders in verse 8 is holding a harp. Oh, so I guess that means that we can use harps in our worship service, right? No, <laughs> no. We know from elsewhere in the New Testament that God's chosen instrument for worship in the new kingdom is the human voice. And the use of anything else is contrary to the pattern for proper worship that God has left for us in his word. Remember one of our key interpretive rules here. However we interpret this difficult book of Revelation, our interpretation must not contradict what we find elsewhere in the Scripture. And particularly, it must not contradict what we find in easy-to-understand verses elsewhere in the Scripture. Well, why then do we see these harps in these verses? Why do we see harps here? Well, remember what we're looking at. We're looking at symbols. We're looking at figures. Uh, this, is, this language is figurative. I mean, only in a vision could you have a lamb with seven horns and seven eyes taking a scroll out of someone's hand. That's the same context we're looking at here. We're going to see a similar symbol in, a symbol in chapter 14, verse 2. I heard the voice of the harpers harping with their harps. Again, those are symbols. Why use a harp as a symbol? Because it's the perfect symbol for praise, for praise. And that's how it's being used here. 
Why is a harp a symbol for praise? Because we praise God using the harp that God has made. The harp of the human voice. The harp not made with human hands. And this harp is depicting, denoting that praise. Acts 17, 24, and 25. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands. You know, sometimes proponents of instrumental music and worship will ask you, well, why wouldn't God like this? You think God doesn't like our, our, our orchestra and our, our guitars and everything? Why wouldn't God like something like that? I mean, we like it. God would certainly like that. You hear that argument. Acts 17 explains why God doesn't like it. Acts 17 explains why, why we don't use instrumental music in our worship. Acts 17 explains it. Why is it? Because the eternal kingdom is not made with human hands. And for that reason, God is not to be worshipped with men's hands. Instrumental music places the focus on man rather than on God, doesn't it? If you don't believe that, just turn on the TV and look at one of those rock and roll churches. That's the same reason we don't have special choirs in our worship to God. Because that puts the focus on man rather than on God. God wants all Christians to sing, not with instruments made with human hands or played with human hands, but with the instrument God made, the instrument made without human hands. Only then does the focus of worship remain where it should remain, on God and not on man. Anyone who thinks that Revelation supports the worship of God with man-made instruments is missing the entire point of this book. And if we're taking harps in heaven as a rule of conduct for the church on earth, as some would have us do, then on what basis do we stop there? There's no marriage in heaven, Matthew 22, verse 30. If we take the harps, how do we hold on to the marriage? And on that note, doesn't Matthew 22, verse 30, teach us that while marriage is pleasing to God on earth, marriage is not pleasing to God in heaven because there's no marriage in heaven. So even if these were literal harps in heaven, which they aren't, but even if they were, it still would not automatically follow that we should, it's then pleasing to God to use them on earth. Because we have an example in Matthew 22 of something that's pleasing to God on earth and not pleasing to God in heaven. In short, those who take this great scene of worship as evidence in favor of instrumental music and worship have missed the boat entirely. They've got everything absolutely and completely backwards. They need to start over in verse 1 and start reading this book again. This great scene of adoration and worship in chapter 5 is strong evidence against such practices. God alone is worthy of worship. And He is not worshipped with men's hands. In verse 7, the Lamb takes a scroll from the right hand of God. Jesus is worthy to open the scroll and do what it contains. One commentator says that right at this moment, right at this moment in the book, we who read and study the book of Revelation are at the theological center of the book, right here, when the Lamb of God takes the scroll and he's worthy to open them. That's the theological center of the book, according to one commentator. And what a beautiful message of comfort. What a message of comfort. The little lamb has the scroll. Satan doesn't have the scroll. The Roman emperor doesn't have the scroll. The lamb of God has the scroll. It is Jesus who holds the scroll. It is Jesus who holds history in his hand. What do we have to fear? What do we have to fear? What a message of comfort. It's not just a message of comfort to the first century church. It's a message of comfort to the church today, isn't it? Because 
Jesus still holds history in his hand. Jesus is still in charge. Jesus still loves his church. And we can take great comfort from these verses. What follows next in chapter 5, starting in verse 9, has been called one of the greatest scenes of universal adoration anywhere recorded. And it is. Beautiful, beautiful chapter describing the worship of the Lamb, worship of God. And these two chapters together, we'll, we'll pick up here next week in chap verse 9, these two chapters together are setting the stage for everything that follows. We're going to see some truly horrific images later in this book. But these are all coming from the throne of God, and they're all being motivated by the love that the Lamb of God has for the redeemed, for his church. Beautiful, beautiful chapters. Next week we'll start in verse 9. Thank you very much for your attention.